Welcome to week three, everybody, of Art 387. Uh, I hope everyone had a fantastic week, too. I did want to let you know that your quizzes, as well as your images and your uh, first discussion board, have all been graded and are in the grade book. If you found that you got a zero out of five on your images, don't panic. Uh, I will regrade this. It just means that the images weren't working, they weren't appropriate. Uh, for the topic of the paper and so I want you to reselect them and once you do and submit that then I will give you those five points. So make sure that you're reading any feedback on those uh, and I'm really glad that I do this because uh, if students aren't picking images that are appropriate uh, I'm able to help you and make suggestions and that's really to make your life and your job a lot easier. So make sure you're taking a look at that. Thank you for the discussion board. Some really interesting work. Some very uh, strong analyses of uh, some of these artworks and you know I, I liked that a lot of you considered that psychology of color chart and that sometimes it wasn't exactly accurate well a lot of times it is so there's some good discussions going on there make sure you read any feedback I've given there as well I will be getting to your mini art cyclopedias uh, I will be starting on those tomorrow so uh, very very worst case scenario I will have all of those done and back to you by Friday but I should be able to get um, to the majority of them within the next couple of days. So be looking for feedback there as well. Always uh, don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions about a grade that I've given you, if you're not quite understanding what's going on, please, uh, I'm here to help, but I can't help if I don't know that there is an issue or that you have questions. So you gotta ask and then I'll know that you need more feedback. Uh, so let's dive into week three, form, content, and context. I really like this topic. Uh, so let's talk about our reading. We're going to be reading individual culture text chapters 2 and 4, which is on form and ideology, and in the looking at art chapter 6, which is art in and out of context. So that's always a really quick read. You do have a decent amount of reading in that visual culture text, and this is, um, this is kind of some intense, heavy reading, but I like to do this uh, before you do your theory application paper because it's really going to prep you for some ideas uh, that you're going to be thinking about, especially with Fry and those five emotional elements of design. So it's really going to be that chapter on uh, form that you're going to want for your paper. Chapter four that's on ideology. Uh, this is really going to be for your, uh, is it a, let's see, is it a discussion board or no, it's a journal. Uh, for your journal this week. Uh, so you want to focus on that section on John Berger or on that section on theorist uh, and critic Laura Mulvey. Uh, and those are both in chapter four. And the reason you want to focus on those is because you're going to pick one of these prompts to write about. So we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so when you are in your looking at art text in the section on form, these are the ideas that I really want you to focus on. So uh, there is more to art than just imitation of reality. That's an important idea that's presented at the beginning. And I've given you a couple of YouTube clips. I've given you uh, one about Jackson Pollock, and I've given you uh, the music video to Oasis' song Wonderwall, which they talk about in this chapter. So just if you want that extra kind of, uh, these aren't required, you're not going to be quizzed on this music video or on this video, but it's just some extra enrichment activities for you if you are more of a visual learner and you want to kind of go a little bit deeper into some of these subjects. So Fry's Five Emotional Elements of Design this is really important because a big part of your theory application paper that you're going to be writing is going to be about these five emotional elements of design and using these to uh, to an analyze uh, your paper. It's almost like doing a formal analysis. So we have the rhythm of the line, mass, space, light, and shade, and color. And so uh, make sure you really focus on these when you're doing that reading. If you get through these and you're saying, you know, I don't really understand the difference between mass and space, I'm having trouble there, uh, send me a quick email and we can discuss this further. So again, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to have a uh, you know, more interaction with you guys, but I can't just email all of you separately and make sure that you're in understanding all the material in the text. So, but I'm more than available and more than happy to do it if you have questions. So uh, in chapter four on ideology, so this guy, John Berger, a uh, really interesting character. Uh, he did a documentary series called Ways of Seeing that is available on YouTube and I've given you the link 
uh, to these playlists. And they're, they're quite old, uh, but they're really interesting. This is not by any means a required viewing and you will not be tested on it. But again, I just like to give you some extra enrichment activities if there are things that you're interested in. John Berger gives us this concept, scene comes before words. I want you to really consider what he meant by that. Consider how our experiences of the world shape our response and our interpretation of a work of art. And uh, it's this almost emotional response that he's talking about that uh, we see, we interpret before we uh, actually analyze and explain. Uh, so this is a, an interesting concept uh, that he dives into here. He talks about making the art of the past mystic. We tend to endow works of art that are uh, older than our lifetime uh, with, with mystery uh, and this concept that they're a little grander sometimes and more magical than perhaps they would have been uh, understood in that moment. And so that's an interesting concept that he deals with. He talks about how is an ideological approach both descriptive and prescriptive. So how does it help us describe a work of art? And then how does it help us prescribe meaning to it? He also talks about recontextualizing the past. So kind of going along with this idea of making the art of the past mystic, he talks about the holy relic debate. So we tend to think of a work of art uh, like the Mona Lisa, for example, that we have this almost religious, religious experience with, that people go on pilgrimages to see it. There's a certain set of behaviors you're supposed to do when you walk into an art museum. Uh, and that's an interesting concept, and he's asking us, you know, why do we do that? Do we, do we make uh, works of art uh, more important then they should be based on cultural knowledge and cultural uh, kind of trends, really. Uh, the Mona Lisa is an interesting case in point because it really didn't gain worldwide fame until it was stolen in, I think it was 1912 or 1914. And that's when its fame was skyrocketed all over the world and it's become known as the most famous artwork uh, on the planet. He talks about authenticity and that there's this desire to see the real thing in person and that we have we take pride in that. Uh, actually, I need to take this part out because this documentary is no longer available on Netflix. I'm sorry, on, uh, on YouTube for us to view. And it was an enrichment activity. So we talked about context. Can a work mean something different for us today than it did for its original audience based on our knowledge of the world? You may want to read, uh, before you read this section on context, or even this chapter, you may want to go ahead and read the Looking at Art, Art in and Out of Context, just to give a simpler perspective and summation of uh, some of these ideas about context, and then go ahead and dive into uh, what uh, our visual culture text is talking about. Again, I, I'm not meaning to scare you off. This is a difficult chapter. I don't expect it all to make perfect sense to you. And so please let me know if you get to a page or a concept that you're just really struggling with. So it talks about, uh, in, in response to this idea, uh, they walk through an analysis of Hans Holbein the Younger's painting, The Ambassadors. And I've included a link to the uh, Wikipedia page, which I know I don't let you use Wikipedia in your research. This is just kind of a good jumping off point for you. Uh, to kind of look at some of the ideas of that. So it talks about symbolism of the image. Uh, it talks about this idea of art being polemic. So look for that word. Maybe you need to use dictionary.com to look up what it means. I'm not just going to give it to you. Uh, it talks about Fuller's perspective. Pay attention there. The politics of gender. This is a really important part here. So the politics of gender, how women are viewed in art. Uh, what is a nude versus being naked? This is a really interesting conversation to be had. And you have to ask yourself, is there a difference between uh, something that's someone that's nude that's representative more of a concept and idea and someone who represents an actual personhood? Uh, and is there are they therefore naked opposed to this kind of idealistic nude figure, say a Venus figure, for example? where Venus is this fictional character who is more of a representation of idealistic beauty, where if it's a woman who was actually a historical figure with a real name and a real story, and she is being represented in this way, uh, 
it can kind of change the way we understand uh, this idea of nudity and nakedness. Laura Mulvey talks about viewing art from a male point of view and that we are all, especially uh, since the creation of film, uh, that we, whether we are men or women, we are trained because of visual culture to view from this male perspective. So you may agree, you may not agree. Definitely read that section, especially if you're going to uh, write about that in the uh, Reflect Journal. Uh, and it goes on. So it talks about Thompson's three-part analysis talks about the social and historical conditions in which a text are produced, that we need to look at that. We need to look at the way they are received by real people. And then our familiar close analysis of a text under discussion. So this is kind of what we're doing now. We're discussing, when I have you guys do these discussion boards as well, uh, that can change the way we understand a work of art when we uh, don't just look at it in a, in a vacuum and in our own little world. So now that we've kind of gone over what uh, those chapters are going to be about, the ideas I want you to look at, you're going to pick just one of these prompts uh, for your next uh, Reflect journal. So again, this is a journal you don't need to respond to anyone. It's just between you and me who will see it. And you can pick either John Berger or Laura Mulvey to write about. Again, this is one page, double space, 12 point font. And that's just a guideline for how long I expect your journal entries to be. You could type it up in a Word document and then copy and paste it right into the text editor. It may kind of goof up your formatting a little bit. As long as you're writing that equivalent amount of words uh, and space, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So if the formatting gets goofy, I know that um, the text editor in Blackboard can do that too sometimes. Okay, so John Berger believed that if we mystify the art of the past by making it into a whole, or I'm sorry, John Berger did believe that, that we mystify the art of the past by making it into a holy relic. My dogs are wandering, or wandering around the house, um, barking at things in the window, so they're distracting me a bit. So excuse my word uh, mess ups occasionally in these. So this does not mean that art is necessarily religious, right? Like we just talked about, the Mona Lisa is not a religious painting, but we sometimes treat them as such with this very ritualistic uh, attitude. We often go on pilgrimages to see famous works of art or treat the experience of viewing them in a ritualistic manner. So I want you to select a work of art that you think fulfills this idea. Probably not the best to use the Mona Lisa since we've talked about it so much already. Uh, so something that you consider to be represented as this kind of holy relic in culture. And remember, this is more of a concept. It's not a work of art that is necessarily religious in nature. So why do you think cultural culture has elevated it to this uh, perspective? And do you think this is a healthy or unhealthy way to view art? Be sure to include the actual image of the work of art in your journal entry. So that's one of your options. Your other option is about Laura Mulvey. So theorist and critic Laura Mulvey believes that when we are viewing art or watching films, the gaze is male, is how she words it. Do you agree? Support your opinion with evidence from the text. So remember, these are one page. I don't want you to write more than that. I don't want you to get exhaust, to exhaust yourselves on these journal entries. These are kind of quick critical thinking exercises. So really think less is more, but it's gonna be quality of your words over quantity, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, you do have your quiz this week, so that is due always day seven at midnight, and so that's uh, your last item. But uh, what I want to spend a little bit of time on here, and I apologize, this announcement's a little bit longer than the others have been, but you're writing your outline for your theory application paper this week. So this is that six to eight page paper that is due at the end of week four, so next week. This week you're writing an outline. Last week you selected your images. Now, do the bulk of the work this week in that outline. I'm going to look at these in detail. I will give you as much feedback as I can based on how complete you make your outline. The more complete you make it, the more opportunity I have to give you feedback on areas where you may need to adjust or places where you know, you're, you're really hitting the nail on the head. This is how I look at it. If you do this, this outline right and do it um, to the best of your ability, next week when it comes to writing your paper, it's pretty much gonna write itself. You're basically going to be putting it into essay format, filling in some sentence structure issues, maybe tweaking some of the ideas I presented, 
and that's it. Don't wait till week four and think, okay, now I'm really going to sit down and research and write this paper. You're doing as much of that as you can this week. So that's why I say the more complete your outline is, the more feedback I can give you for your paper. And be sure that you view the rubric. So if you go into the week four learning activities, you can pull up the theory application paper and you can click on the rubric and it will pull up for you just to give you a little bit more of an idea of how I'm going to be grading those papers. This is what the outline looks like. I've given you a template. So you can see here there's a document, a Word doc file, and there's a PDF file. So you can download the Word doc and just use that and fill that in or you can download the PDF. And then you can kind of just, uh, you know, rewrite uh, some of these bullet points. So this is only worth 35 points. It's not a massive assignment point-wise, but it's really going to affect the outcome of your 100-point paper that's due next week. I'm going to be looking for a strong introduction, so I want you to really hook your reader with that thesis sentence. It's going to be talking about what this whole paper is going to be about. Introduce your two chosen artworks. This should just be brief. You don't need to you know, give all the citation information in sentence form. You're going to have your images in the paper with their full citation. So if you just want to say you know, the title of the work and, and the artist, uh, and kind of tie it in you know, to that hook and thesis and that you know, whole introduction. You want to introduce the theories that will be discussed. So this is going to be just a short you could do this in one paragraph, uh, Panofsky and Fry. I don't need a whole biography of who these guys are. You're just going to quickly introduce their theories so that your reader knows what this paper is going to be about before you jump into analyzing them. So uh, bullets points two and three, this is the meat and potatoes of your paper, right? So we're going to set up the scene. And then we're going to use Panofsky, and we're going to walk through the primary, secondary, and tertiary or intrinsic levels. So, you know, the primary or natural, the secondary or conventional, the tertiary or intrinsic, as we learned. You may want to go back and review that uh, Panofsky lecture. And it really should be that that primary level um, is very simple. Don't overdo it. That secondary level is going to you know, be a, li a little more in-depth. That tertiary level is really going to be where we get much deeper. This is where you want to include research. So you're going to need to do some outside research. I call it looking outside the picture frame uh, to you know, figure out who this artist was, what their intentions were, their historical background, what was going on at the moment, uh, what, what you know, elements all came together to get them to create this artwork in that specific moment in history. Uh, and that's going to really help. And that's where Panofsky is really so useful when it comes to analyzing a work of art and discerning meaning. So you're going to do that with each of your two artworks. With Fry, which is the next section, I want you to ask yourself, how do your chosen works illustrate the principle of the actual and imaginative life? So this is what we're going to read about with Fry this week. And so actual, you know, just because something is abstract doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't represent actual life. It just may do it in an abstract way. It may be more about an idea or an emotion that is very raw and natural and human, uh, but they've just presented it in a way that is a little more... Uh, akin to describing that emotion rather than um, describing, you know, the technical aspects of the world. And imaginative can also be uh, something that's very naturalistic. Uh, for example, one of you has chosen to uh, write about uh, a Salvador Dali painting, and his paintings are very naturalistic and realistic, and yet the images that are the kind of content of his work tend to be very abstract and imaginative. So just because something's naturalistic doesn't mean it's not imaginative, and just because something is abstract doesn't mean it doesn't represent the actual world. Excuse the dogs. Okay, moving on. So how is the emotional impact shaped not by what is shown, but by how it is shown? This is really useful, and this is why I have you pick an abstract work and a naturalistic or realistic work of the same subject matter. Because we're going to see how two landscapes that have similar subjects, maybe both have a bridge over water, are can give you two completely different emotional responses, even though they're very similar in what they're actually showing. 
It's how. It's that how that we keep talking about. It's the tools in the artist toolbox. It's the use of color and line and space and all of these elements that Fry is talking about. So that is going to be setting up the stage for then actually walking through Fry's five emotional elements of design and comparing and contrasting those two works of art. Really make sure you focus and bring it all back to the concept that these elements, they're emotional elements of design. So they affect our emotional response. So make sure you're always bringing it back to that emotional response. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I want a really good, strong conclusion. Don't end your paper right here. Often students do that and they just leave it hanging. I want a strong conclusion. How have the theories of Panofsky and Fry been useful in discerning the meaning and emotional impact of the two works of art that you've chosen to write about? So again, you can see this is your paper. This is how I want it formatted. Uh, and this is going to help you walk through all those elements and really organize yourself and your thoughts well. So what else to include in your outline? Any quotes from the text or outside research that you will use in your paper? So go ahead if you're going to, you know, in, in the tertiary level of image two, if you have a quote you want to put, just go ahead and put it under this bullet point in your outline so that we know that's, you know, where you're going to be using it. Uh, place these quotes under the number or letter of the outline. Okay, so we just said that. Work cited section, do that now. Uh, this is something I learned when I was uh, doing graduate school is that by doing my work cited section ahead of time because it's one of those most tedious things, it's done, it's out of the way. I don't have to then when my brain is exhausted from writing, go and do this busy work of doing that work cited section. So just do that research ahead of time, get it done, get your work cited section done and put it here at the end of your outline. Make sure you include your images with proper citations. So you should know how to do that by now. And remember, we don't write in first-person narrative voice in formal papers, so no I, me, my, okay? That is your theory application outline. I apologize this has been such a long announcement, but that's what we got going on. Busy week. You have your review quiz, you have your theory application outline, and you have a reflection that is due. So this is what is due for this week. Uh, those three items, a lot of reading to get through, so get going on that. Again, let me know if you have any questions uh, there, and we are good to go. Have a fantastic week.